Um, and with that, I am going to pass it off to Noam. I will unmute myself. Um, so I'm Noam, I'm the, the uh, dramaturge and judge for Shakespeare's Showdown, which means I'm the, the person coordinating the, the texts that you're going to read and also working with Tori and then everybody who's testing to um, figure out the, the format for each round because just the basic task of cold reading old timey printed Shakespeare isn't challenging enough. Um, I'm also, if you see me uh, kind of awkwardly shifting and adjusting, it's because this is going on. Um, so I'm 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 being sat on right now, um, and she gets cranky if I don't pet her enough. So um, I need to, you know, uh, multiple responsibilities. Uh, I am being very boring right now and drinking um, slightly flavored club soda. Um, uh, but I, I also have a truly disgusting um, birthday cake flavored Oreos here, just in case I need to like fill myself with sugar and chemicals. Um, so they're in their own way. Um, and I don't know, favorite mistake, I mean, who watched the Sondheim birthday concert? Um, because that was pretty amazing as far as uh, the combination of theatrical mistakes and technology. Um, so I'm going to go with that. And I will um, pass it over to Stephanie. That's me. Um, so I work with Walking Shadow Shakespeare Project. And we do a lot of kind of pop-up theater stuff. I moved across the country uh, after founding that group in Rhode Island and decided that I didn't want to give it up or move it. So we've done, for a couple of years, we've done Zoom rehearsals. Uh, so we were prepared for this pandemic. Um, we do Zoom rehearsals for a couple months, then we have one day of in-person rehearsals and we just do the show. So we've had a lot of mistakes. Um, <laughs> I think my Probably my favorite, uh, which at the time was not my favorite, but um, we were doing Much Ado, and my now fiance was Benedict, and he, I, we were, I was watching the gulling scene, and all of a sudden there was a splash. We do this show in a park with a moat that surrounds it, and it is not clean. It is not sanitary in any way. And I look over, and then he pops his head up out of the moat and is just dripping wet and cut. It was commitment, but um, I thought he had just like fallen in or it was entirely on purpose. So I guess it doesn't necessarily count as a mistake, even though at the time I was convinced something had just gone horribly, horribly wrong. Um, turned out great. Everyone loved it. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably my favorite, like not planned show moment. <laughs> and do I pass it along or? Absolutely. All right, uh, David. Hello, I'm David. I'm the artistic director of Hamlet Isn't Dead. Uh, we are producing the entire canon of Shakespeare in chronological order. Uh, we're a little over halfway there and determined to keep going through all of this. Um, I am drinking uh, Prosecco to start uh, because today, fun fact, uh, was supposed to be I got married back in October and my wife and I were supposed to leave for our honeymoon today um, to Scotland uh, under normal circumstances. So we like pop champagne instead and I have that to start. And in case that proves too bubbly, I've got a St. John's Irish red ale, which I don't know anything about and I might hate. Um, but my, I think my favorite recent mistake was, and this is not just an excuse to show off my dog, but it's also an excuse to show off my dog, um, Archie was playing crab uh, in a little holiday benefit recently. And uh, he was on stage with a different actor playing Lance. And he, when he clocked me in the back of the theater, he just would not stop. Like he was like pulling and whining and trying to get to me. And I had to like lie down in the back of the theater underneath everything uh, to make sure that he couldn't see me to let him at least focus a little bit. 
and that was my favorite mistake. <laughs> He's my favorite mistake. Um, and I will pass it along to Emma Claire. Hello, uh, I'm Emma Claire. I am the artistic director of the International Order of the Sword and the Pen, which sounds like a group of spies, uh, but it's not really. Uh, it is a group of stage combatant uh, theater geeks, sword geeks, stunties, uh, martial artists, and historical martial artists uh, who share practices and techniques about movement on theater and stage and within our art forms. Um, we uh, produce an international workshop uh, every two years. Uh, I was coming up to the, the first of the workshops I would be producing when international travel became even more precarious than it normally is. Um, so, so that's where we're at. Uh, and that's when I first came onto Zoom as having board meetings with people around the world and coordinating time zones and all of that kind of thing. Uh, but I'm speaking to you now from Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, I am drinking currently at Birds and Bees. I have another in the fridge. These are Williams Brothers Brewery, uh, a Scottish brewery on Alloa, and they're great. Um, yeah, and my favorite on-stage mistake, uh, the first professional on stage mistake that I had, uh, I was in a production of The Wizard of Oz and uh, one of the sort of veterans of the company started playing this game. It was a summer tour, well, a summer series. So you're doing the show like a hundred times because you're eight times a week and all that kind of stuff. And about two months into it, she starts playing games with the rest of the cast. And uh, this one particular show, she brought a rubber snake on stage and she was playing the Wicked Witch. Um, so basically every scene she was in, she would bring this rubber snake and, or she'd plant it places so people would, like the lights would come up and you'd suddenly find the snake hidden behind your props or in your costume or whatever. Um, and on this particular show, after we've had the whole show and Dorothy is wheeled on to stage in her bed going, there's no place like home, there's no place like home. The lights came up, like it expanded in her view and she opened her eyes and looked down and she dropped the snake in her lap. So the audience wouldn't be able to see it, but she opened her eyes and she of course had been too busy playing Dorothy the whole time <laughs> to notice that the rest of us were playing a game. Uh, <laughs> and so she looked down and screamed and the whole company on stage while trying to sing uh, like the reprise of Somewhere Over the Rainbow was in kinks. <laughs> And so as a young actor, like in my first professional show, it was kind of embarrassing. And then to have your artistic director pull the entire company up afterwards and like tell you all off, it was mortifying that I cannot imagine being that particular actor who started the game. And she, she was great and she owned up to it in front of everyone <laughs> as we were all like, oh, we are bad professionals. <laughs> um, but it was very funny. Uh, to tell the story many years later, <laughs> having moved on. Um, yeah, I will pass it on to Rodrigo. Hello, um, I'm Rodrigo, and uh, or Rod, and um, I am the artistic director of Shakespeare in the Ruins, SIR, in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, I just started my job in the fall, and previously I was, uh, I spent four years at Stratford in Ontario. Um, so I'm now back in Winnipeg. I was born and raised in Brazil, but Winnipeg is, uh, is kind of like my, my home. So in SIR, um, what we do at SIR is we do um, outdoors, site-specific uh, Shakespeare every summer uh, at the ruins of this uh, monastery that are part of a heritage park. So it's this beautiful, gorgeous, kind of gothic, you know, magical ruins of this old church-like building, this monastery. And, uh, and we were set to do uh, the winter sale uh, this year. Uh, and obviously that's not happening right now. Uh, it's postponed. Uh, and also in the fall, we do a school tour. So we're still hoping that might happen sometime in November, depending on what schools uh, plan to do as of September. So we are uh, uh, hoping. 
Um, I am drinking gin in a Campari glass, which is really unusual. Usually I'm a Campari, I just drink Campari straight up, I'm a huge Campari fan. But tonight it's gin and it's, it's, it's really uh, doing its job right now. Um, and uh, my favorite mistake, I think, um, um, happened when I was in drama school. Um, um, and I was doing a measure for measure. And um, at the beginning of the second half, um, the guy who was supposed to come in and speak with me forgot to come in. He was still outside smoking and he just forgot to come on stage. So I said the cue and Ishan was his name, never showed up. And I just stood there alone on stage like, a, like an asshole uh, waiting for him to come on and he never showed up. Um, and then I was terrified for a bit, realizing that uh, improvising Shakespeare was impossible. Um, and then I, for some reason, said the line, if only it were Pinter, uh, that it could really have bo you know, enjoy a nice long pause. Um, and so the audience enjoyed that. Uh, uh, they kind of cooled me off. But then finally he came on, sweating and, 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 and apologizing with every line he had after that was, you know, uh, 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 the action was to apologize. Um, so uh, it, was, it was really fun to watch him freak out for the whole scene following that when he came on late. So yeah, that was pure acting <laughs> from me, Sean. Have you forgot to come on? And I will pass it on to Kendra. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kendra Jones, and I run a tiny little company called Impel Theater. Um, what we do is um, we create work that makes us think about the way we relate to other people and the way we relate to physical spaces. Um, and that's all sorts of different things. Sometimes it's productions of existing plays, sometimes it's rethinks of existing plays, um, and sometimes it's whole new stuff. Um, either written or um, kind of site-specific pop-up interactions with physical spaces that have a theatrical component. Um, lots of experiments. I refer to most of my shows as experiments. Um, so fortunately for, for us, um, I had just done two shows in a row in two cities. I had taken my production of Tim Crouch's I'm Alvolio to Winnipeg, um, where I'm originally from, and then we I had um, a production of a Judith Thompson play here in Toronto and we fortunately closed to like I don't even think a month before the whole city got locked down so feeling very very fortunate as much as it was kind of a wild um, couple months of my life that we didn't push anything back because then we would have been more affected so um, yeah feeling really fortunate in that run. Um, what am I drinking? I am drinking um, the delightful Reed's Distillery Lemon Gin. Reed's is a local uh, gin distillery in Leslieville here in Toronto uh, with a nice uh, La Croix um, lemon uh, soda water. Um, and my favorite on stage mistake is actually from a very very long time ago. Um, I was I think maybe like grade two, grade three, and you know, they make you do those kind of crummy school concert things where um, there's like, you know, a little crappy scene and then another class comes on and sings a song and what have you, and there's kind of a narrative, what have you. Um, so the one uh, that we were doing was about this uh, school where the teachers, there was like a blizzard or something and the kids had to do the show on their own. So there was this bossy little girl who was gonna go on and tell everybody what to do, that was me. Um, and so there was this one scene where I was supposed to kind of like storm on and tell the class that they'd done a really bad job after they finished their song. Um, but in the rehearsal, I guess we were tight for time or something because of recesses. And so I didn't actually hear what the other class was going to do. So I understood they were only going to sing one song. So after they finished singing their song, I like storm on stage and I like give the line and I tell them off. And then the teacher who was sitting on the floor was like, actually, they have another song. <laughs> so then I had to like mortify <laughs> to like walk off stage and then like sit there and then do it all over again after they finished their second song, which is personally the most hilarious at the time I was mortified, but it's hilarious to look back on. <laughs> um, and I think I'm last, right? Was I last out of the 80s? I think you are, uh, but we do have two more people who haven't. Yeah, I'm gonna pass it. I just want to make sure I got everybody there. So I will pass it to Danny. 
Uh, thanks. Um, so my name's Danny. Um, I'm the general manager of Spur, um, and I also have my own collective um, that was supposed to be doing a show this summer. So you know, we're all in the same place. Of we're supposed to be doing a tour of three cities um, in July and August, um, and the festivals have all been postponed till next year. So I'm gonna do it next year. Theoretically, we're gonna try to do like a workshop version in the fall, but that's so it's just being really wishful and maybe it'll work out. I don't know. Um, uh, I'm drinking water because I have a headache. Um, I spent a long day just on screens and I find that like, I, I'm, we're, I'm just not used to looking at a screen all day and it makes me exhausted. Um, so I don't wanna push it with alcohol. Um, my favorite onstage mistake, I was in a show with a really close friend um, and he had this big dance number um, and he was wearing like the most amazing like feather gown and like full face drag makeup, like lashes, wig, everything amazing. And he's dancing around and he decides that he's going to be ambitious and do the splits, which he's never done in this number before, um, just because he's feeling really great. So he does the splits and I see because I'm really close to him on stage doing the number with him, I see in his eyes that something has gone awry. And like, he kind of starts to well up tears in his eyes, but he's still doing the number, but he's not getting up from the splits. And I, when he went into the splits, I heard like something pop. When I had to like, luckily we were in tech, we weren't in front of an audience, but I like never before have I like had to like, literally be like, no, no, stop, turn the music off. <laughs> and he like dislocated his head. Um, like he popped it out of the socket and then our choreographer popped it back in, which I don't know if that was a good call, but at the time we were like, you're the choreographer. Um, and then he did the first week of performance on crutches. Um, and luckily we had a break in the middle because it was running over Easter. So by the second weekend, he was able to be off crutches, but that's always like a cautionary tale for like, don't add things to your choreography, especially not stunts that you haven't practiced. <laughs> um, and I'm going to pass it to Blythe. Thanks, Danny. Um, so my name is Blythe Hain, and uh, for Spur, uh, I'm the producer of Shakespeare in Hospitals and, and the social media gal for uh, tonight. Um, outside of that, I'm an actor in Toronto. I also have um, a theatre collective called Gangway Theatre Co. And we do uh, stories that are Canadian. We do stories that are female focused and focusing on voices not often heard from. We also had a project uh, that had to be kind of tabled. We were going to be doing um, last month uh, a reading of our show, which is a literary theater pub crawl based on female authors in Toronto in the early 20th century. So that'll happen when it happens, but uh, you know, same boat. Um, I guess like uh, I guess when I was in theater school, I think the one that I was I always remember is we were doing Major Barbara, and I was I was in the third act, and we all wanted to just be done because it's a long show and uh I was we all came on and one of the actors just did not come on stage he was playing my fiance and um, at all and so we went through probably the first 20 minutes didn't come on and then he had a bunch of lines that uh, had to happen um the way the set was none of us were looking at each other and so we all just sort of I don't know intuited who was going to say the next lines we all kind of said his lines even though they really made no sense for us to say them at all um and he did come on stage to walk me off stage um it turns out uh, he had been playing poker in the dressing room <laughs> with all the uh, actors who are not in the third act um so all the people from like the salvation army essentially um and <laughs> he never did that again so that was, that was mine i feel so blessed to know that so many people have had so many crazy theater mistakes, um, similar and yet so different from mine. <laughs> Makes me feel like I'm in such good company. Thank you for this. Um, so with that, why don't we indulge in some more mistakes right now? Uh, to get us started, uh, Noam, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that we have one piece to get us all kind of warmed up, um, which is a little bit different from round three. 
I, the, the rules are a little simpler. It's just reading line for line in a group of three. And uh, this is generally how we will get started. Emma, you will be very familiar with this. Um, what is the name of that amazing round and and the name of that the the name of the game? The name of the game is weakest link. Everybody drink. Um, because the the rules for the other rounds are when you make a mistake, um, you drink. But because the first round is um, as much collaborative as it is competitive, um, we believe in collective punishment. So uh, if anybody messes up, then everyone takes a drink. I'll, everyone who's participating takes a drink. So the, the first round um, is a, a speech shared by three players. Uh, and you read, each player reads one verse line. Um, so just one line from beginning to end, not a, not a complete thought, just the, the um, line of verse. Next player reads the next line, next player reads the next line, and then it goes back to player one. Um, it, for some reason, all these structures are very simple, and then as soon as we try to explain them to people, they, they become... Um, very difficult somehow. Um, That's okay. I'm just I'm just chalking it all up to pandemic brain, personally. So speaking you, of speaking of mistakes, I'm drinking a margarita, which I totally forgot to mention earlier. So I guess that's mistake number one, and I'll I'll take a sip for that. Goodbye. <laughs> um, speaking of mistakes, we haven't even said the oath yet. This is this is just a very backwards night, friends. Um, um, also, Tori, before you before you go into that, um, I feel like I'm hearing you through two different microphones. Do you have two feeds both on? Hmm. Hmm. Is this better? You guys are gonna see my family wandering around behind me now. They just came back with pizza. <laughs> uh, I want pizza. Same. <laughs> I will refrain from eating it on the live stream. <laughs> Give me one quick moment. Better? Kind of. It sort of sounds like you're in a metal container now. I think that audio is just on on both of your devices. There, we go. there you go. Yeah. Ah, thank you. All right. That being said, let's get into the oath. I will ask that you take your right hand and you place it over your heart. And you take your left hand and instead of a placing it on an appropriate body part of a consenting neighbor, um, you will place it on your drink. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> and in your worst British accents, I will ask you to repeat after me. We have come together. We have come, <laughs> we have come, together. come together. To honor <laughs> Mr. William Shakespeare. And all of his debauchery therein. And all, and all, his all of his debauchery therein. therein. I will not be dishonest. I, I will, will not, not be dishonest. dishonest. <laughs> I will not break seal. I, I, I will, will not, not break, break seal. seal. I will not spill my cup. I will I not will spill, not my, spill cup. my cup. I will be true to the text. I will, I will be, true be true to the text. To the text. I will to be true text. to my scene partner. I, I will, will be true to my, my scene partner. partner. And above all, and above, and all, above, all, above all, I 
I, I will, will, will drink, drink, drink my, my, my mistake. mistake. Mistakes. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Oh, there we are. There we go. You gotta love how worse British accent really just translates into Monty Python. Monty Python. Women. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that I'm already said. refilling. <laughs> I gotta find the, I'll be right back. Gotta I find my bottle. Perfect. <laughs> Alrighty. So we know how round one goes, and we have a rough sense of what it looks like. So I'm going to ask three brave souls to volunteer to read one, two, and three. All right. And uh, Noam, do we have our timer set and ready? No. And what are we reading? We're getting there. <laughs> oh, I'm not even there yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Timer's ready. Um, let me do a. Uh... For the purposes of round one, um, and getting everybody comfortable. We are going to do a screen share, which is just wow. what we're doing now. Oh, oh I can geez. see you all now. <laughs> Magic. <What's this? laughs> You're back. <laughs> all right. Can we see the text? No. Oh. Labor's lost. Who's, who's moving it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's me. Okay. Okay. Ah, okay. Uh, this, this makes it harder. <laughs> if it's just like it's, if it's consistently zooming it's, in and out. I mean I don't know what you're talking about. How many have you <laughs> Wow. Okay. Alrighty. Um so we've got our three readers. Uh David, Emma, and Stephanie. Emma Claire. Emma Claire, my apologies. <laughs> I've already had six of these now. So. Yes. <laughs> that goes right back at me. Um, all right. I, so, readers, are you ready? Yes. Judges, are you ready? Ready. And audience, are you ready? Uh, Sweet. <laughs> Three, two, one. Cheers. A time me thinks too short. To make a world without end bargain in. No, no, my lord, your grace is penured much. Full of dear guiltiness, and therefore this. If for my love, as there is no such cause, you will do aught, this shall you do for me. Your oath I will not trust, but go with speed. To some forlorn and naked hermitage. Remote from all the pleasures of the world. There stay until the twelve celestial signs have brought about their annual reckoning. If this austere and sociable life change not your offer made in heat of blood, if frosts and safts hard lodging <laughs> if frosts and Fasts, hard lodging, and thin weeds. Nip not the gaudy blossoms of your love. But that it bear this trial and last love. Then at the expiration of the year. Come challenge me, challenge me by these deserts. And by this virgin palm, now kissing thine. <laughs> I will be That's thine. Very close. <laughs> Until that instant shut my woeful self up in a morning house. Ooh, and that's time. Oh, good, because I right. lost the order. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Great. Nice work, team. Nice away. work, team. She couldn't stand it. <laughs> she left. She's gone now. We did so bad. Right. <laughs> well done, you guys. Yay. Yay been a while since I've tried to read. When I first got the email, I was like, oh, we're just reading Shakespeare. It'll be fine. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, no, no. No. this makes sense no. now. <laughs> now I, I have get it. to say, reading photocopies 
of original text is one thing. Doing it off a screen, like a photocopy off a screen is yeah. like you've upped the game. <laughs> Up here. And then you've got no moving it in the background. Like Yeah, I like that in this medium it goes from Hi, I'm gonna do this thing to like, all right, now I'm reading yeah. the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to dip out there, folks. I we did, we did it really was well. perfect. Yeah. yeah, it was like essentially <laughs> perfect. Amazing. So we all know how this goes. Fantastic. <laughs> yes, that explained everything. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one, um, because I wouldn't be a dramaturge if I didn't offer some feedback. Yes. Um, uh, if you If you mess something up and have to drink, just um you don't need to like go back until you get it right um we can just kind of like, keep, <laughs> keep galloping along um we've had i think the first time i participated in shakespeare's there was at least one sadistic judge who forced people to keep trying and taking a drink until they got it right um and it's fun in a cruel sort of way um <laughs> but it's it's preferable for in terms of our um game to keep going and get to the next thing especially because like when it's the full event and a whole evening um and emma claire you'll remember this as like right it's this game goes for a while so we want to like keep it moving rather than um yeah also i just want to take a quick moment to say hey friends guess what we're live! Oh yay! yay. I'm, uh, I've got us loaded up and what's hilarious is there's a delay. Oh, no. <laughs> so, oh, really? well, no, it's, it's just, it's just like how the internet works. So we're about, I don't know, maybe 10 seconds behind on what's happening online. Uh, okay. Which is okay. actually really trippy. <laughs> Cause yeah. then, you know, if we weren't already in a time warp caused by the great pause, uh, then we're actually in a time warp caused by this internet and how that works. Just for fun. I, well, that's, that's I, I mean, we're also pause. talking to each other from different time zones, so that's time travel in and of yeah. itself. Speaking of which, I'm the one in the late time zone. I, it's tomorrow where I am, so I should just shut up and we can make this on. <laughs> what happens tomorrow? I, so far, it's dark. <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. Um, so, so everybody knows. Yes, we are uh, live. So we will get some of our audiences uh, back. If you want to take a moment and give a tweet, uh, as I give our audiences and everyone a refresher on what round three is going to look like, uh, please do so now. You can tag us on Facebook. You can uh, tag us on Instagram and Twitter. Our handle is at Shakespeare. Or if you are archaic like me and you type things into your Facebook address, uh, it's facebook.com slash shake the spur. I'm apparently the only person who, who accesses Facebook like this. I've accepted it. It's, uh, it's, it's my cross to bear. Um, as we go into round three, um, just a quick reminder that we are working in pairs. So we will be working with two different readers and you may have multiple roles to read. And you will be reading for a maximum of four minutes. And here's where things get interesting, especially with our audiences. Um, I'm sure that just went right up my nose. Um, <laughs> our audiences will be watching this and when they feel like it, when the internet doesn't feel like lagging either, um, they will be telling our readers to change genres. I, extra points audience, who, for those who are watching, I, if you give a genre, <laughs> if not, we will arbitrarily assign one. I, this is going to get weird, friends. This is going to get fun. And with that, Noam, am I missing anything from this round? Is there anything else that I need to explain? 
Nobody told me there was going to be fun. Except, Tori, folks are just letting us know in the chat that the live is sideways, um, which is why Blythe and I kind of gave up because it was getting really complicated. And I feel like the recording will be good, so maybe we should just stick with <laughs> there, there is there is an option. How's this? I'm I mean, my my screen is is right in the middle, and then just Rodrigo and David just went <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> Amazing. Um, cool. <laughs> just that there's a phone that made maybe should be tilted upright. Let's see what we can do here. Maybe I'll just hold it like this the whole time. <laughs> And not film my bathroom door. <laughs> We're gonna figure something out. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna ask for two brave souls to volunteer <laughs> for the next read for round three. Kendra and Rod should do it. Yeah, because we, we, <laughs> yeah, we didn't volunteer okay, before. Sure, we'll do it. You're still, yeah. you're still Helen, brave. Helen, you're slightly but... less brave, but you're still brave. <laughs> We're still a little bit brave. Honestly, I didn't yeah. see it. You showed up. I can't see the video. I, I'm here, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. oh yay! We're we're right side up as well. Yay. We are. I was yeah. so ready to go like this. <laughs> no, for anyone with inner ear things, it's been adjusted. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I should have probably given warning on that one. This is this is the more casual Shakespeare's test night. <laughs> the super casual. <laughs> Why is it called Ultra test cash. night? Um, because I like testing everyone's patience. Um, I will say the, the camera is currently more on the laundry machine than the actual computer. <laughs> also the chat. <laughs> Sorry, should I just chat that? Should I not talk that? No, I was about to say it too. Like, <laughs> so that it would be oh. in the chat anyway. <laughs> Our audiences are having like, a great time right now. <laughs> So I'm just gonna sit back here, make sure that I uh, keep an eye on this. And uh, we've got our our two readers. Um, Noam, we've tell me that you've got the timer at the ready. What are we reading? Are you screen sharing? I, I do have the timer at the ready. Are we? Hey. How are we reading? Is my um, question. So for is, this, uh, with the pieces improvising, and everyone. Uh, we're going to ask you to pull it up on your own computers this time. Gotcha. Okay. Which, bit? Which one? That's a great question. Noam, what is the first yes. thing? <laughs> um, can we do the um, uh, Much Ado Quarto? 2.1 page one. Oh my god, you got a quarter here? Oh Jesus. <laughs> what? Why would a Fine, why, we'll just rod. Oh my god. What did, what I, did have, you think I want to have a was? whole conversation about why a quarter would be more scary than a polio. This is the one that begins. Oh. This is this is two one. Yes, and there are two pages to it. <gasps> two pages. Yeah. Page one. Oh, okay. like, conveniently page. labeled as page one and page two. Let's see. What have I done here? Oh, but one is from the. <sighs> I sent you both. So yeah. Um, ah, I see. Ma ha ha. So it's like. Yeah. A bunch of characters. Is that right? <laughs> I see page yes. one and I see page two. We got this. We hang got on, this. hang on. Uh, page. So, okay. I mean, this is crazy. We're going to start with page one, and then when we get to the bottom of that, we're going to move to page two. What? We'll see. I know. We'll see if we get that far. <laughs> and we, are Just we starting with uh, Pedro's line? So, we're starting with. Come, lady, come. Um, I don't, Pedro's I second don't. line. So after Benedict leaves, yeah, <laughs> and oh, oh, sorry, with come. Oh, okay. Pedro, can yes. yes. <laughs> All right. Um, and I'm, what are our character breakdowns? Um, so we will have um player one, which will be Rodrigo, will be. Um, Beatrice and Leonardo, and player two, who is Stephanie, will be um, Pedro and Claudio. Um, Mike, Kendra, 
Is it Stephanie or is it me? Oh. You. Exactly. Wait, Kendra. Okay. It is Kendra. Yes. Cool. Sorry. Awesome. I'm, no worries. I'm trying to look at three screens. It's amazing. <laughs> this is so going I'm, so I'm, well. I'm, 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 I'm so am I reading? <laughs> um, you're reading Pedro and Claudio. So you'll have a few okay. moments where you're uh, awesome. you're dialoguing with yourself. Um, nice. And the, the the challenge for round three is more about the the genres that change on you. So um, lean into the the improv game factor more than the like. I need to get the Shakespeare perfect factor. <laughs> it would be my my note. Um, all right. Okay. So right, I've, go got, I've got I've got text i've got a timer and may be able to look at the screen where you guys are as well Oof. Um, how are we feeling i'm a little drunk we're, we're, we'll be okay uh, <laughs> that's perfect all right um, okay. Okay. so just to introduce the no. scene briefly so this is this is um kind of the middle of act two scene one which is a scene where lots of stuff happens most of which we're not going to worry about um and right now, this is where the, the action winds down a little bit, and we get some, some chatting between um, uh, the Prince um, Pedro and his host, Leonardo, uh, Leonardo's niece, Beatrice, um, and Claudio, who is um, a ostensibly charming young man who anchors the romantic, the main romantic plot. Um, but maybe comes off a bit sour, at least in this moment. And um, Blythe, are you, are you ready to throw genres at them? Oh my god. Yes, <laughs> I am. Um, and Noam, are we still doing this that uh, if the audience gets bored, then we change it, or is it mistakes? I think- uh, No, it's all, it's, all, it's all you. So just- so you, so you all have to entertain me. Excellent. Yes. I will do my um, best. <laughs> and, I'm and Blythe, as yeah. a, a format request, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say uh, rather than, than like the whole throwing in the whole phrase like the, the genre now is, um, just give like a crisp um, Western or like whatever it is, just throw it right at them. Aye, aye, Captain. Yeah. Um, all right. That's enough of me talking. Let's get you guys talking. All right. So, readers, are you ready? No. Not really, no. <laughs> Excellent. We will be great. We will be amazing. Um, judges, are you ready? Uh, yeah, sure. As Shakespeare said, the readiness is not that big a deal. Yeah, yeah. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> um, audiences, are you ready? I'm going to take that as a yes. Oh, yes. Three, two, one, cheers. Come, lady, come. You have lost the heart of Signor Benedict. Indeed, my lord. He lent me a while, and I gave him use for it. I double heart. A double heart. Fuck me. Drink. Commedia <laughs> uh, dell'arte. What? Commedia oh. dell'arte. Ah, double heart for his uh, uh, single one. Uh, Mary, once before he wanted of me, uh, he uh, 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 safe dice. Drink. <laughs> with uh, false um, dice. Therefore, your grace may well say I have lost it. You have put him down, lady. You have put him down. Horror. What is it? Horror. 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 Okay. <laughs> uh, so, I would not he should do me, my lord. Left, I should prove. Really? Lest, lest, lest. <laughs> Lest I should prove the, the mother phones. of fools, I have brought Count Claudio, whom you sent me to seek. 
Why now, Count, wherefore you sad? Not sad, my lord. How then, sick? Neither, my lord. The Count is neither sad, nor sick, nor merry, nor well, but civil Count. Civil as an orange, and something of that jealous complexion. School play. What, sorry? School play. <laughs> Faith, lady, I think you're blazon to be true, though I'll be sworn, if he be so, his conceit is false. Here, Claudio, I have wooed in thy name, and fair hero is won. I have book with her father, and his good will obtained. Name the day of marriage, and God give thee joy. Count, take off me my daughter, and, and with her my fortunes. His grace hath made the match, and all grace say amen to it. Speak, Count, tis your cue. Silence is the perfect hero of joy. Mm. I were but a little happy if I could say how much? Game show. Oh, no, I did. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? Game show? Game, game show. Lady, as you are mine, I am yours. I, I give away myself for you and do it upon the exchange. <laughs> and brief pause while we skip, go to page two. Page two, right? There we yeah. go. Speak, cousin, or if you cannot, stop his mouth with a knife and let not Drink. him. <laughs> Fuck me. Uh, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan. <laughs> where, where are we now? Uh, stop I'm his mouth with not. a kiss. Uh, Oh my god, I don't even know where we are. The, the the second ah, second ah, line ah. of the page. Ah, and let not him speak neither. If faith, lady, you have a merry heart. Hey, my lord, I thank ye. Uh, but poor uh, soul, fool, Drink. fool, god damn it. <laughs> All right, and that is time. Um, thank god for that. <laughs> Woo! Just Can I just say how different genre? to play this, this scene is very different when it's top, stop his mouth with a knife rather than I as written, stop Look his mouth that. with a kiss. I don't like that rewrite, though. The <laughs> web server. <laughs> All right. I like that so some genres give you more room for like taking your time, though. You're like, oh, no, this character speaks yeah. slowly <laughs> on <laughs> purpose. <laughs> I'm always amazed by the things that people bring forward for these genres. Like, I, one minute it's, it's interpretive dance, and then the next minute, well, as we said, it's Tennessee Williams, and then the next minute, I guess it's Gilbert and Sullivan. Um, I have the hardest time interpreting some of these. I'm amazed at what everybody's bringing up. So I know. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. All right, on a scale of one to 10, one being the easiest, 10 being the hardest, readers and, and listeners, what, what would you rate this piece? Point Six five far allowed. Mine weren't bad, so mine are probably like a four, but Rod's were way harder. <laughs> hard, super Wait, hard. Wait, we're rating how I'll difficult it was? Yeah, we're rating difficulty level. Um, you can you can also look at it as like one level one being um, difficult for someone who just got out of theater school or hasn't even been to theater school um, and and is in high school and and that it's a yeah and then sure. <laughs> and then uh, ten being like. Know him. <laughs> Just that's Congratulations, Noam. 
Wow. Yeah. You are the pinnacle. <laughs> I, I had to mention, I had to mention that I think page two got even harder yes. and you, you didn't yeah. really get into page two. So like if page two is included, this would probably yeah. be a good seven or maybe even eight. Um, yeah, because page, <laughs> the second part of this scene does not let up. <laughs> no, it really doesn't. I think because so much of Much Ado and these comedies and some of the genres we're throwing at it are about rhythm. And if you, if you don't have the rhythm, um, you don't have, like so, so many of these comedies, like yeah. Much Ado and Neighbors, are pretty shallow in terms of, of, the, of, the, of depth of, of, of sentiment, but there's something about the rhythms of them that are because very sophisticated. And most of much ado well is prose together. though right there's the, the pro yeah and, and, but and there's the still like a yeah there's like a balance like a like a like it's got a staccato kind of back and forth and if you don't have that then the words actually don't fit in properly well there's nothing to hold it <laughs> like love's labor yeah. to do if you don't have the it's rhythm the going and it, it doesn't hold there's not that depth of of of, of, of king lear so if you don't have the rhythm, if it just breaks, <laughs> and if it just kind of stalls, there it's just shit. So <laughs> it's just oh no, it was like our shit. school children. <laughs> so, uh, but but the cool thing about the, the 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 kids the whatever kids play was that it was forcing us to play within the rhythm, right? But then the mm -hmm. GNS was it's hard because it's fast tempo and you don't want to find the rhymes, but there's nothing there in the prose, yeah. and it's like, what are we doing here? Um, yeah. Like sing song? What else are you gonna do? I don't know. I was like, I oh. think, yeah, I think the um, the genres, uh, if there is a little bit of a clearer selection of the genres, then that can support because there's some things, especially when they're more well known texts, that harder genres like something like Gilbert and Sullivan would be more fun to play with if it's something more familiar already. Mm -hmm because then you can play the genre as opposed to <laughs> just trying to be finding out what the words are. <laughs> trying to say the right word. <laughs> Why? Why are there so many Fs? <laughs> <laughs> so many consonants. That also makes Every me time. really curious though too, um, for when it's, when it's the, the scenes between, specifically between Benedict and Beatrice, unless I've totally misunderstood the scenes in looking over the material previously, all of 30 seconds before um but for for the witty back and forth it's not so much a rhythm but there is a bit of a shot for shot going on if that would have a different impact or have the same impact or what have you i mean i think uh, this is sort of like going off on off, maybe off the rails but like i mean for the comedies and especially for the Beatrice and Benedict stuff, like rhythm becomes character, right? So that mm -hmm. like, if, if she's something clever and he needs a pause of 20 seconds to come up with a response, that is a very different character and a relationship than if she says something and he's just like back in with something. Um, yeah, it's true. I mean, like it, rhythm is meaning and meaning is rhythm for sure for these comedies. Um, and to have, <laughs> it's tough to keep rhythm in, 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 a, in a, not knowing what you're doing. Yeah. In a cold read, <laughs> you got to, sorry, yeah, exactly. I was, I was, uh, I was told that if it freezes, you have to mix up the Wi-Fi. <laughs> and that helps. Oh. Um, oh, it also, is, <laughs> it's really indicative of, then you can tell if it's kicked on again, or if it's still frozen. I, I, is that not a thing? <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a sounds like a real thing. Sounds legit. None of us yeah. are internet I think it's a so thing. We can't we can't disprove it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the Wi-Fi signals in Scotland are thicker, so you can mix them uh, by hand. Uh, I mean, like oatmeal. Just yeah. 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 Well, then you need a spurtle. But also, I have to. <laughs> It's speaking speaking of um, of rhythms and these being duologues, it's interesting to think of how one person's interpretation of a, of a style influences your 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 response to the style. 
you yeah. know, you, know, you kind of go like, is that what the style is? Am I going for that style? Am I going to go honor that offer? Or am I going to spin it towards this offer? What is it? Sty- what is the style? Do you know what I mean? And whoever gets the, the style offer first sets the tone, literally. Yeah. And then you kind of have to go like, am, am I going to? it's a it's an interesting question which which again begs the question when we're rehearsing these plays as actors we're so seduced we're so inclined to being seduced to somebody else's rhythms right we, we often mm-hmm. especially canadian actors we're very polite we're very nice we often fall into somebody else's rhythms to kind of go with it mm. but sometimes the more interesting choice is to go against uh, somebody's rhythm but then you find a a, a frisson that kind of is electrifying but you know it's it's interesting it kind of it, it, these genres being tossed into the piece you know make us think about the question of of rhythms and how they kind of go together or or against each other well and i also think like some of them jeff i'm thinking like horror for sure i was like oh, i don't even know what to do okay that works with what's doing i'm gonna go because <laughs> i was I like know, yeah. no no because no. some of them you really like can't because it comes at you quickly and you're still trying to sort out the words so yeah the genre plays a um it definitely weighs on your choices and your ability oh to make God. a choice yeah <laughs> and on I that note that conflict of rhythms is where a lot of comedy lives too right like where you get mm-hmm. the you know the i mean one of my favorites is like the 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 angry person and the calm person and the calmer the calm person is the angrier that makes the angry person who's just like no you we need to be mad about this and like fast and um, I'm and just gonna just like the, the refusal I'm gonna to pause us them right here be just because it is yeah. well my computer says it's 730 which actually means that it's probably 738 um if y'all look down at your reactions yeah. button in the bottom uh on the bottom bar of zoom I uh, there are a couple different icons that you can use I'm gonna ask that everybody gives it up for our support workers and our essential workers thank you all essential workers you're so amazing yay is it, can you can you can you can you can you clap no okay i don't know yeah i can see him i have a four-year-old here with me oh, oh. Is he? Is he, can you say hello Hi, is he? Yeah. <laughs> we just got a bajillion oh, hearts. And I wanna do this for my daddy. I'm gonna do this. Already. Okay. And mm-hmm. on the note of rhythms, mm-hmm. I think on back to our next scene. Noam, do you wanna dive into what that one is? Yeah, give me a second. What was I? Oh, okay. Um, ah, I'm on the right scene in the wrong page. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so let's do the King John. Um, I will talk about this in a little bit. So this is uh, King John, Act 4, Scene 1, um, Actus Quartus Scena Prima, um, which also has two pages, so be ready. Um, who, uh, this one only has the two characters. All righty. So we've got two readers for two characters. All right, Emma Claire has volunteered. And David. Oh, well, yeah, why not? All right. Um, so arbitrary casting. Um, Emma Claire, can you take Hubert? Um, and can David I? Arthur. Oh, good. Um, oh, no. And I'm sort of trying to decide how much to say about the scene. This is <laughs> a scene about a child being threatened with violence. Um, I maintain that this is probably a very funny scene, but that's because I find Arthur to be like 
sort of insufferable and the thought of terrible things happening to him amused me greatly because I'm a terrible person. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's one of those scenes that can be like clowned up a fair bit or played with real heart and stakes. So we'll see what happens when we throw <laughs> genres at it and also like two okay. actors no rehearsal who are just reading stuff as they go. Uh, Alrighty. Yeah, I think that's about as much as as much as much context as we need. That works. Uh, readers, are you ready? Yes. Are we starting around uh, Enter Arthur at the top of the scene? Um, from Enter Arthur. Great. Okay. And judges, are you ready? Yes. Everyone else, are you ready? Yep. Genre thrower? Yes. Yeah, ready to be entertained. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and audience members, remember that you can also enter into the chat here as I'm talking weirdly to my phone and to the Zoom conversation at the same time. Mm -hmm. Give us some suggestions. All right, <coughs> three, two, one, cheers. Good morrow, Hubert. Good morrow, little prince. A little prince having to greet a title to be more Rick. prince as started as maybe you are sad. Indeed, I have been merrier. Mercy on me. Methinks nobody should be sad but I. Yet I remember when I was in France, young gentlemen would be as sad as night only for wantonness. By my Christendom, so I were out of prison and kept sheep, I should be as merry as the day is long. And so I would be Court. here. What? Courtroom drama. Ooh, dun dun. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would be here. But that I doubt, my uncle practices more harm to me. He is afraid of me, and I of him. It is my fault. Darn it, is it my fault? <laughs> That I was Jeffrey's son? No, indeed, it's not. And I would, ah, and I would to heaven, I were your son, for you would love me, Hubert. Drink. If I talk to him with his innocent prate, he will awake my mercy, which lies dead. Therefore, I will be Fidane. Drink. Uh, we're going to do soap opera. And dispatch. <laughs> you sick, Hubert? You look pale today. I would you were a little sick that I might sit all night and Watch with you. I warrant I love you more than you do me. His words do take possession of my bosom. Read here, young Arthur. How now, foolish room. Turning this precious torture out of door. I must be brief, lest resolution drop out at mine eyes in tender womanish tears. Can you not read it? Is it not fair writ? Too fairly, Hubert, for so foul effect. <sighs> Must you with hot irons burn out both mine eyes? Young boy, I must. And will you? Vaudeville. <laughs> I will. Have you the hat? When your head did but ache, I knit my handkerchief about your brows. The best I had, a princess rotted me. And I did never ask you again. 
Oh, darn it. And I did never ask it you again. <laughs> and with my hand at midnight, held your head, and like the watchful minutes to the hour, still and anon, cheered up the heavy time, saying, what lack you? And where lies your grief? Or what good love may I perform for you? <laughs> Many a poor man's son would have lied. <laughs> still, darn it. <laughs> still. Uh, and here I have spoke a love, and never have spoke a loving word to you. Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm -hmm, but you at your sick service had a prince nay you may think my love was crafty love and call it cunning do and if you will if had me pleased that you must use me ill why then you must will you put out mine eyes these eyes that never did nor never shall so much as frown on you period right, drama time. <laughs> oh thank god <laughs> Put them in a barrel. <laughs> yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> I like that it almost became like um, detective movie, like film noir. I felt like every genre of mine was going towards noir, and I, I learned a lot about myself in that process. But that's just my, that's my only true <laughs> genre. Everything morphs into noir if you give it long enough. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's all in the changes. Just every change we make, it's like, ooh, all right. And uh, now I'm taking this dramatic pause, and then it's just all dramatic pauses. That's it. Yeah. Uh, I have to say, I was probably using my hair too much, uh, which also didn't help because I can't see through my hair. Uh, and I don't know what the lines are unless I read them. So apologies for that <laughs> misthought choice. <laughs> Um, hey, no, lesson learned. Um, for what our mean? competitors who should not be watching this right now, um, you should tie your hair back. That's a <laughs> fact. <laughs> that is a, that is a helpful tip. More hair acting. More hair acting. <laughs> I actually, um, in, in one of my graduating theater classes, third year theater classes, one of, uh, we, we had to work with a prop as, as throughout a monologue. And and um, one of my classmates used their hair as as that prop, and it was super compelling. <laughs> so I bought it. <laughs> I was thoroughly entertained. Great. Uh, I haven't seen this scene performed a lot, but I I don't think the um. Uh, threat to put out someone's eyes with hot pokers has ever been as heatedly flirty as as this take um that was right? that was an amazing version of that moment you're welcome. i want to see that shakespeare company that's like we do every shakespeare play as if all the characters want to fuck <laughs> I feel like I that mean, might be the majority of university theater groups. <laughs> it is. It is. It definitely is. So we're, we are fan All fiction actors, Shakespeare. <laughs> Any, anything that where the entire What's company so like, is made up of actors oh, under the age of 23. <laughs> and like all in the same yeah. class together and like. Just, yes. Just it may not be a choice, but it is what they're telling. <laughs> I, I was watching this King bro. Lear. The King Lear, yeah. What I find fascinating about this process is, uh, as a reader, I've, I've found that, and also as a, as a listener, where the disconnect between what's happening in here and what's coming out, you know, really, <laughs> like the, the chasm between your mind and what you're trying to achieve and what is coming out and keeps coming out is amazing. Like I found as a reader, do, do, do reader, fellow readers feel that way as well? Like there's a, there's a, there's a sense of, this is where I think I'm going to go or take the scene, but somehow what's coming out is is not really what I'm intending. Funnily you know enough, I mean? every director I've spoken with makes me feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> I think this 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 game highlights that kind of chasm. Do you know what I mean? Like, does yeah. that make any sense? What I'm saying? Maybe I'm just drinking too much. It's yeah. It's hard to <laughs> tell without a control group of doing this without drinking. <laughs> I do think there's something to be said though for like 
just doing the word, like fitting the words into different genres without actually like thinking about the context behind them that opens up like, like that last scene, like it, it got steamy and no one's like you said no one's ever gonna do that when you take the words out of context and like yes young boy like it just (laughs) out of context there's so much I think that that you can do maybe sober or not (laughs) it might come out differently but I think it's a fun way to kind of explore like the actual words that they're Mm -hmm. saying yeah, what the what the genres and the styles really force you to do is to really pop certain words, right? Which we sometimes, in trying to be good actors, we uh, we underplay everything to try and be natural and real and committed and human. But the genres really force us to to pop to make some tr- strong choices and to pop certain <laughs> words that make you go like you know like like young boy really pops as opposed to us trying to downplay that as real human beings. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like that. I like that a lot. Or you just get stuck like me, and then all of a sudden it's like, and now I'm mocking everything. Well, yeah. <laughs> this is not boring. Boring Shakespeare is the worst. Right? This is true. Yeah. I I once saw someone try to make. Well, that's not the thing though. It's when you when you get into. I'm trying to hold this at the same time. This is super hard. Um, but when you get into I. Uh, you know the acting challenge which like be boring be as boring as you can and then you go uda and and now everything you do is super interesting because you're trying so hard to be boring and it's impossible um i it's interesting to kind of follow those those moments where we try to make ourselves boring and it just ends up being re- i've gone on five tangents because i'm doing six <laughs> things at once Hello, right? Jimmy. But like when you try, I'm when you try, it, boring. yeah. When you try to be bad, usually you make some interesting choices. Yeah, like when you're trying to be yeah. bad, like you know. And and one of one of my biggest uh, uh, heartbreaks as a, a theater, um, v- you know, viewer, was watching Patrick Stewart play Shylock at, at the RSC in 2011. Like I saw him play Shylock, you know, live in Stratford in the UK. And it was it was his fourth Shylock by then in 2011, and this was a uh, a modern dress Las Vegas setting of The Merchant of Venice, and so it couldn't be more out the box, more you know outside the box, directed by Rupert Gould, and I was watching Patrick Stewart live, and I, and as a Star Trek fan, I was like, this is amazing. I'm watching Patrick Stewart live do Shylock, but he was making the same choices that you can see from those 1970s plain Shakespeare videos with, uh, mm. with a John Barton. He was making the same choices and playing the same Shylock. And it couldn't have been more different than the things he was doing on video in the 70s. It, it was, a, it was a, a modern Las Vegas American accented Shylock. And he was still making the same choices. And it kind of broke my heart. It was still Patrick Stewart and amazing. But I was like, wow, this is your fourth Shylock. And you're just kind of playing the same safe field that you've done three times before mm-hmm. this. And you kind of, you know, so those, the, the idea of choices and, and how, and to dare yourself to be bad and make mistakes, which I think is the project here, is, a, is, is really dramatically interesting. Because I, I remember leaving the theater heartbroken, having just seen fucking Patrick Stewart. Yeah. The the irony is he probably got paid the most for that fourth. <laughs> yeah. For his fourth Shylock. But I think that's same. like well, uh, when we do shows with one day of rehearsal and then just boom, go into it. Uh, you don't necessarily get into those like choice ruts where you've made a decision and you've made a choice and then you rehearse it and rehearse it and rehearse <laughs> it and rehearse it and then it just isn't a choice anymore. It's just kind of like this uh, repetitive thing. We have so little time that everything feels like fresh and new and there are a lot of mistakes but like our audiences don't come to see Shakespeare they come to hang out with their friends at the park and you know see someone jump in a moat so I think it's there's <laughs> yeah. so much freshness there and Every it has time. shown me a lot more about some of the characters and some of the plays that I've done a bunch of times before I'm like oh I didn't know you could do that that way it's a fun way to to look at it yeah. When we started, when I started at U of T, I think my, it was either my first or second year, um, 
so either the MA or early PhD here, I've worked on a project um, where we did a um, very, very deservedly obscure uh, pre-Shakespeare play called Sir Cliamon and Sir Clamides. Um, and the, the experiment, it was a rehearsal experiment where the actors learned um, literally their parts. So there was no collective rehearsal. Every actor was given their script, which was their line and the last word of the cue line and no sense of how much time there was between cues. Um, and it was, um, so I was, I was part of the dramaturgy team and would like work individually with the actors as, as sort of coaches and we knew the play and they didn't. Um, they got like one, um, the director did a, a reading of the entire script for the company. And then we went from there. And like the quality of listening when everyone is terrified and only knows their part and is waiting for to you know uh, see what what they're going to receive was kind of amazing um it was also like it's one of those plays it, it's shaped like the later shakespeare plays like the the late romances so cymbeline and pericles and that kind of thing where there's like um tons of chaos and then everything gets very organized by the last scene where like all the the threads are tied um but because of this rehearsal process like every rehearsal process, you get to know the beginning of the play much better than the end of the play because you go from page one. So as the play was getting more and more sedate and organized, the performance was getting more and more chaotic and loose. Um, and it was just, it was, it was fantastic. Amazing. It makes me think of like, I, I often imagine thinking of Q scripts I often imagine the very first Horatio working of you know working on first script of Q scripts, not knowing how long Hamlet would be talking for, you know, and just and then suddenly saying, "I am my lord," and then Hamlet just go off again and, and for two pages. The level of listening must have been so electric that we we rarely get that in rehearsal these days. But can you imagine not knowing how long Hamlet would be talking for? Yeah, you've either got a Horatio who's going. Mm -hmm. Or Horatio is going, come on. <laughs> I know. Bold choices, right? It's got to be the same oh, in the histories, though, because, like, I feel like those are even, they've got to be longer, longer pieces than Hamlet. I don't know if I've ever looked at the length, but, like, if I had to sit and listen to Hotspur without knowing when it was going to stop, I, I might go crazy. Oh, those, um, those Henry, Henry, one, two, three. Henry, six, one, two, three. Oh yeah. I'm uh, I have to I have to cut this off. I want Let's I want it. to keep talking about this forever, <laughs> but I, I have to cut this off. Um no I believe we have we we do have one more scene. Um we we can have one more scene. It, it, um we're kind of leaning into I, I I'm loving the groove that we're all kind of leaning into. So I, I'm I'm gonna leave it. I, I, I'm a little more inclined to to having some more Q and A from our from our audience because I know Blythe has a few questions here, and I know I've got a question to wrap us up, and I'm pretty inclined to make sure that we stay on time with this. Um, so why don't why don't we hold off on that one? Yes, for me now? too. <laughs> it's it's <Thank> you. one a.m. <laughs> ah, this is. This is this, this is the latest I have stayed awake since lockdown. <laughs> I appreciate because I would be so drinking much. alone otherwise. So, <laughs> um, I'm not going to mention my 4 a.m. bedtime, but then I just did. I uh, Blythe, I believe, has a question or two from the audience, and then I have a question for everybody. Um, but for right now, I Blythe, why don't you take it away? Hey, thanks. Um, yeah, so I have two questions um, from our audience. Uh, one is from uh, Monique, uh, and she wants to know, what's the best rumor about Shakespeare you've ever heard, if any? And that's for anybody. So the best rumor about Shakespeare that you've ever heard, if any. 
There's so many puzzled looks. <laughs> I don't know if it's like, I don't know. I don't even know how to answer that. I feel like it's all rumor, right? Isn't it? Isn't that <laughs> the problem is like so much yeah, of no speculation? One really yeah. I can think of like rumors with rules and like, um, here. Oh, what about the rumors that he did all the that he did a bunch of the lady characters? Isn't there like a rumor that he did Lady Cap when like an actor got sick and and couldn't do it? And I think even Lady M once. I think there's a rumor that he did them. Um, I like those. I like to imagine those in a very Shakespeare and Love way that he's backstage <laughs> going like, "Oh, I'll just oh, just let me do it." <laughs> <laughs> I I like the rumor that uh, Gwyneth Paltrow believes she actually at one point had sex with Shakespeare. Oh, for fuck's Ooh, what? Go on. What? I mean, <laughs> that sounds like Gwyneth Paltrow to me. Yeah, right. Like, didn't she astroplane in a dream? And yeah, like yeah, meet yeah. him in yeah. that makes sense. <laughs> I'm sure there's a goop article about it. Uh, yes, please. Probably a whole edition of the magazine dedicated to that story. <laughs> oh god. Uh, wow. <laughs> that wins. Um. <laughs> wow. I I kinda like the idea. I kinda like the idea that he never was, that he was just this like poster boy for some rich noble who it would have been too scandalous for them to actually do it. And so they chose Shakespeare. Like, I kind of like to imagine that he was just an actor who was chosen to be the face of. Mm -hmm. um, because I almost think that that's a more creative, interesting story. And I kind of like that we don't know who it is. So that there's, side, there's the side that you can believe that one person came up with these words, invented these words, and retold these stories, and sort of got to be the face of this. But actually, it was it was a company of putting things together, and there may have been multiple playwrights coming together. I mean, I, um, and I'm kind of okay with not knowing who it is because it it sort of feels like they were okay with not knowing who it is, hmm. um, and that. Maybe none of them thought 400 years later people would be on a medium like this discussing them. They were just like, God, we need a paycheck. Let's put it under Shakespeare. He's been getting a lot of cred lately. Queen likes him, so we can probably fill a theater. <laughs> we'll have a really great story up until the fifth act, and then we have to solve it. So send a bunch of letters. Done. Yeah. Have a wedding. <laughs> have six Here. letters. Have a like, wedding. Yeah. One for you, and you get a wedding, and you get a wedding. I mean, there are a number of plays like that. Yep. Oh yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a convention. Yeah. I mean, there's a. If we can't a, have weddings, then everybody dies. Like back <laughs> when I was researching Shakespeare and Marlowe, I came across there's this like amazing crackpot book called i think i forget who wrote it. it's called the murder of the man who was shakespeare and it's just like insane um conspiracy theory idea that like um marlowe not only like murders shakespeare fakes his own death and takes over being shakespeare but also somewhere along the way like also manages to be thomas kidd as well <laughs> it's like you know, as ridiculous Marlo as was other authorship <laughs> thing. So absurd. Um, but fascinating. fantastic. There's something to that though, and picking up on what Emma Claire was saying, and, and you were saying that I think that in terms of you no know, rumors, but I think what we're just properly learning in a more um um a public uh way is how back then they used to run uh writer's rooms like it was much more like mm. um like what we now are uh we now associate you know like uh, uh um, um tv shows with you know like you have this was one of the first playwrights to have his actual name printed you know like as an author of a play which was such a huge thing for one, one of the first, one of the first ones as, a, as opposed to be like a, an anonymous playwright or like or not mentioned at all but one of the first celebrated names right um but uh but to have like a, this idea of a and I firmly believe that he was whom he was, but he was not writing in isolation. He was writing as a, in a collaboration, right? It's a, it's borrowing and and stealing oh, yeah, and for sure. listening and 
and he was certainly uh, working as a big sponge, you know, just taking all the stuff in and then putting it on paper collectively, collaboratively, and, and, and then together as a company, making this play, this event happen, but certainly not work in isolation. So this, this idea of Shakespeare as a collaborator is, is uh, fairly new to the, to the larger public, but it's certainly the, the, the view that I think is the most um, of value right now, because this idea of him alone as a genius creating something out of nothing is completely unrealistic, right? Yeah. Well, one one thing that's unusual about him is, I mean, he he does he does collaborate on a few scripts, um, but he's one of, um, if not the only one of very very few playwrights who's a um, a member of a company, mm -hmm. right? He's he's part of the Lord Admiral's men and the, the King's men, um, and which means that he gets he gets a share of what the um, what the play makes rather than almost all playwrights. Uh, are writing either um, for hire or they're writing on spec, right? Where they'll write a script and then try to, to sell it somewhere. Um, but it which means that Shakespeare is writing for a specific group of actors, right? So he knows um, who's good at what, who likes doing what, like when he's got... Um, Burbage and Camp and all those guys. Yeah, um, right. And so like you can see, I mean, one of the really obvious examples, um, obvious, is... Um, when Kemp, who's the, the the main fool in the company, leaves and gets replaced with Armin, um, right? Kemp is a big guy who can hold a stage, who has a, a kind of a particular comic style. He's the, he's Falstaff, um, he's Bottom, and then Armin is this little dude who's like very cerebral and really wordy. <laughs> um, so he's uh, Touchstone, um, he's Festa. He's the grave digger in Hamlet, um, right? So these are not just like a writer creating these different kinds of parts. They're just like, oh, this is what this guy does. And he's a brand, like the, the clowns are, are performers in their own right. They're brands, um, right? So you've got to write to what they can do, but also find stuff to challenge them. So I think from an AD perspective, that's really fun to think about too, because you have your, we do, like we're super, super small. Uh, so we've got a pretty regular cast of characters that come out for our shows. And, you know, you see it's as a small company, we want to cast different people. Like we don't, we have one actor who is our camp, right? So like we want to make sure that we're giving as many people opportunities as we can. But when you have that one actor who is who that role was written for, you know, it's, it's funny to look at like how you break up casting of the different plays and how you build your seasons to make sure that your company is is covered. I agree with that. Um, and I just because I don't want to I don't want us to run too far over. I think I'm just gonna swing in with the last the last question here. Um, hey friends, I where do we think that theater is going to go after this? What patterns do we see? I know, I know we all heard it. We've, we've been asked it a bajillion times. I've been asked it too many. Um, but I think that it's, it's consistently worth asking because my, the way that I was answering it at the beginning of this is not the same as how I was answering it now. And we're just seeing so many different trends pop up. Um, where do we think that uh, the theater scene is going to go from here, wherever we are? Um, I can say for myself in Toronto, I think I voiced this a little bit last time. I think that indie, indie companies are, are gonna have a bit of a takeover for a little bit because they're going, going to be the companies that can pick up on things the fastest. And then there's going to be a bunch of packed companies that may jump on that and go, okay, we want to be a part of this. And then there will be an elevation. Um, but uh, I know for one thing, there's going to be a lot of hungry people and a lot of hungry artists. Um, and there already are now to create. Um, but hey, I could rattle on about this forever. How about y'all? 
Well, this is the optimistic side of it that, um, you know, there's, there will be an afterward, like any sort of natural disaster where things, there, there is so much new growth, right? After a forest fire, after, you know, a natural disaster, um, we will see people being hired to be health officials for theaters in a way that has never happened before. We will see understudies and swings uh, being hired more, you know, stringently than ever before. Um, it's, it's, it's one of those, like, I, I, I think at the end of the day, we all subscribe to theater's been around, it's going to keep being around. Um, it's obviously going to look different, but hopefully for the, for the better. Yeah, I think, um, like from my perspective, running a really small company that does, you know, really kind of like I said earlier, experiment kind of, you know, work in terms of figuring out what the act of theater even is sometimes. Um, I think it's super important that we take this moment to, to kind of rethink the medium, you know, don't just rush to find a way to make something that was like what we had before, but really challenge ourselves to, um, to look at, you know, accessibility and medium and all of those things and how they all come together um, while we now have this new lens of, you know, you might have to have a smaller number of people in the room, you might need to do certain things in order to have them in that room, um, that, that sort of thing. So for me, I think it's a really, it's a huge opportunity to um, just rethink what we do and try to adapt and, and morph it into something new and, and exciting. Yeah, I, f I found, like I spent today writing grant reports and emailing what people now, you know, like to call stakeholders. And it's a, a word that drives me bonkers. But I, uh, um, but that just speaks to the uh, corporatization of our theater medium, right? We, we have people that, um, Listen, when we talk about, when we talk with donors and sponsors about theater, we don't talk about money. We talk about theater. We talk about why, why, why they want to support the company, why they want to support the cause, because they love theater, um, which is great. Um, I think for, we'll, be one of the, we'll be the last sector really to kind of recover from this. It will take a while we will have to fight to make the point that our emergency funds are still needed for longer than most people. I think a lot of people are gonna go like, but why are they still getting funding from the government when they should just get a job? Well, there is no job in theater right now because it takes a long time to plan. Because theater we're the so first ones they look to. That's right, yeah. So I think <laughs> be, uh, that, that's the kind of the political admin side of it. I think we will, as our as ADs, it, it will be our job to kind of help frame the conversation for the post great pause world of what it means to to be a theater in this in this world, um, to offer this unique experience of live shared community making you know event. Um, there's no doubt theater will remain and will evolve and it continues to evolve. But, uh, but I think the question is, you know, as an AD, I think a lot about the admin side of it. You know, I think about a lot of the conversations regarding, you know, equity and agreements and forms and fees and all that kind of stuff. Like there's no way we can, we can just suddenly not have streaming anymore. Like streaming now is here to stay and extra and equity will have to find a way to talk about that properly. Um, and the, you know, there's no way we can just roll back on this idea of connecting digitally. I think digitally we've jumped, um, you know, light years in the past two months. Um, but I think like, like, uh, like you said, Stephanie, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and Victoria, I think you said, our audiences will be just as hungry to come back to the theater as our artists will be to do something in front of them. I think our audiences will be so eager to just, you know, be forced to sit through something. Because right now, I'm not sure about you guys, but I'm having a hard time sitting through the National Theater's Frankenstein and Stratford's Macbeth 
and sitting through this other stream. And the French, you know, Camille Frances, the, I'm having a hard time sitting through the whole thing in one go. I find my brain kind of drifting. I find my attention span being fragmented. And the great thing about theater is that you're forced to sit there and endure it. And that can be good, can be painful. <laughs> but even in the pain of it, you, the idea of you being forced to go inside yourself is amazing and transformative. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think we will be hungry for that, but most people will not know they will need that. So it will be our job as ADs to tell them, listen, come back, we'll give you something to just stop time for a bit and take this mm -hmm. in together. And it will take work. It will be a couple of couple of years, I think, until we can come back and feel a little healthier and, and until a vaccine is available. But I think when we come back, it will be so amazing and so amazing. And I think we've, we've gained so much more relevance as a form, as a movement, as a, as a community. And it is electrifying that we're in the middle of it right now and we still don't know what the, what the, the outcome is. And we get mm -hmm. to like shape that and, 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 and dictate in, in, and inform and take part in the dialogue. It's amazing. And hopefully a lot of artists have like taken this time to be learning new things. And I know a lot who have. I, one of my favorite things like at the beginning of this was, was a tweet that was something like, all these offer only actors not knowing how to find their self tape angle really shows. <laughs> I think it's so yeah, funny no. and, and true. You see all these like big name actors who are on these Zoom things doing these readings and like, here I am, I'm ready to do this Zoom reading. Um, <laughs> and I, yeah, I think it's been very uh, educational it was, for a lot it of people. Was, the uh, the Gal Gadot uh, Imagine song, where none of them were in the same key or rhythm, <laughs> and it was such a basic thing <laughs> that besides like the real self indulgence in it, it was it was more like could could none of them pick a key? It, it, it was such a basic skill that it made me feel sorry for them. <laughs> uh, Especially again, us as admin, gesture. right? You're going, who put this together? Who, who is, where's the stage manager for this? Yeah. Well, and the, no, well <laughs> they're all right. filmies, so none of them have met a stage manager. Um, Maybe. I would, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak from a, a different culture and a different funding body and a different size of country and all of those things. Uh, I have to say, I really love, Rod, your like almost aggressive feeling of like what theater is and like, we keep them there two and a half hours. You're getting two acts and you must stay. Sit through this. <laughs> to I endure. To, I, I can tell you. I have to take one of my earphones out because I'm not, um, yep. <laughs> I have to be aware of how bad I am because I'm in a building and everyone's sleeping. So oh, no. <laughs> just tone it down. Um, uh, yeah, so the UK in general um, funds the arts in a different capacity and that comes both from having a longer history, a more in-depth history of theatre existing, of the arts existing, but also a country that is so much more compact, like it's just closer together. So, I mean, in my career, I work, I work all over the UK. And it's, uh, it, there have been more, more weeks than not where I'm, you know, from one end of Scotland to the other, working in different places. And that's brilliant. And it's really exciting. But that's not possible in Canada. Like, no. putting on a tour in Canada, like, you're lucky if you can do three parks in Toronto and not totally go bust, just from paying people's public transport, transport fees. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's different... Uh, and population density, and I, so I completely understand that there are different factors. Scotland itself has this beautiful history of pub theatre, of like the village hall, of um, sort of gig music and storytelling being wrapped up in theatre as well. Um, and there were great political movements in the 70s and 80s of companies that had nearly no money or were quite literally singing for their suppers, developing into the most exciting theater companies of the country. 
um, and getting funded to do things and then different governments coming in and changing things and all of all of that as as there are in most countries really um, but the feeling here I think uh, within Scotland there are I think there are eight major theatre companies and six of them have buildings like have a theatre that they a building that they control I would say two or three of those buildings are probably going to close they just won't be able to keep up as a business model um, no business no business whether it's theater or I don't know accounting like there's no business that's like hmm, we're gonna run on the basis that if we had to close for three months completely and no income would come in we'd be fine like no business runs that way and we've been asked as an industry not just to do three months but now we're like indefinitely but also pay your employees you know anyone you've contracted to your capability um it is truly the most overused word of 2020 already and we're only at may is unprecedented um so like you can't fault anyone for that i really don't think you can even the companies that are uh, over here i haven't kept uh, as close an eye on on the toronto scene or the canadian scene but the companies that are trying to start initiatives and then <laughs> hiring the same people they always hire or offering them to the same people they always offer to i mean i can't even fault them for that because they're probably trying to honor contracts for the show in a year that they don't know if they can honor anymore or the show next month that they were supposed to do i mean you you can't throw a stone without hitting someone who's lost a number of jobs that have been in the works for a long time. Um, so all that being said, with all of these big companies, I'm really I'm really pretty excited to see what the young companies who haven't had all of that overhead, who haven't had buildings to run and rent to pay and administrators to pay for who are going to come up and say, you know what, uh, my living room can seat nine people. So we're going to invite nine people to come over and they pay a fiver at the door. And that's the start of theater. You know, when you can expand your pool of people, we've been in lockdown over here. I don't know. Uh, I know Canada's <laughs> the way I describe it to my pals is that Justin Trudeau went, Hey Canada, will you stay home? And most of Canada went, oh, okay. Yeah. Where's over here? Give or take, yeah. That's what happened. Slightly different story over here. Um, <laughs> I love it. Papa Justin. Um, it's, yeah, I think, I think we're going to get things really soon. I think people are going to be performing outside of windows. I've, I've been watching the, um, uh, there's a woman who sings opera in the one of the villages um in toronto she sings it from her balcony and it's brilliant she, it's uh it, i don't think it's liberty village but it's one of those like super artsy nothing but condos there's like two thousand people who live on a square block it's my um, neighbor oh yeah like uh <laughs> it's it's incredible and i think there's going to be more of that where in the really populated areas where people can be in their homes and things are just offered to them. All that being said, like I'm in development for two or three different projects that are using Zoom as a platform to do theater. I want to offer to you uh, to take a look at Creation Theater. They're based in England. Um, I saw a production of The Tempest two weeks ago that they did. It's a, it, they were going to tour it as a theater piece. They're a site-specific company and they did it on Zoom like as theater on Zoom with an audience that you're there with the audience. So you agree to your picture being used, you're, like you're recorded throughout, but the audience was included. So Ariel was having the audience as her spirits. Um, but that also meant that like, as she's having you be wind, they would show different audience members. So you really feel collective and communal with them. And they're doing a series of shows over the next couple of months. And I highly recommend looking them up and watching that because what I learned as a theater maker 
from watching that production is massive. And it gave me so much hope. And as opposed to sitting back passively watching the National Theater sometimes get it really right and sometimes just like masturbate to their excessive budget. Um, oh gosh, it's late. This is recorded. Mm -hmm. Mm. <laughs> hey. Now the whole National Theater will know National what you've Theater said. They know. They know. <laughs> because then I, you know what, Tori? I hope the National Theater is watching this right now. <laughs> um, I do for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, but I would offer to you as artistic directors to watch um, Creation Theatre to take a look and see if you can um, catch something that they have on because it's, uh, it's fascinating. And the tickets weren't expensive to their show, but they employed, what, eight actors or something like that who all... Um, there's actually been a few things uh well it's not not quite the same as what you're describing but um there's there's been a few uh phone call theater events that have happened here um and then there have been some one-on-one -on -one theater sessions uh um I, uh, my my friend brian postalian just did uh did a huge uh huge one um and he's over in vancouver right now um, please do, please, please, everybody contact Brian Postalian right now. Um, I, I am so sorry that we are running well over time and I, I am afraid that we're gonna have to wrap things up. Um, but Emma Claire, please send me all of the information. Um, Blythe is already on looking for, uh, looking for all, <laughs> all of the ads and I, I love it so much. Thank you, Blythe. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is, this is going to be on our Facebook for a while so that the National Theater can just, uh, see it I will all. make sure to share it with them personally. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they get a, they get a good shout out. Frankenstein was brilliant. Jane Eyre. I haven't seen that one yet. I'm, I'm excited. For well, you've got a couple well, days. A couple I days. do. Ooh. Their Treasure Island, also brilliant. Um, even really if you cool. catch, I would recommend this to everybody, even if you catch the first 10 minutes of their Frankenstein to see the creature it's very good. basically being born. Watch Johnny's creature. I saw it twice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's... I heard him in the background. Hey, buddy. <laughs> oh, he's right. back. I, I think it is time for us to wrap this up. Um, viewers, we're gonna make sure that there's also our recorded version so that it's not half as shaky as my hand is. Um, Never gonna blow it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you all so much for, for your patience and, uh, and first and foremost, for your creativity, your insight, your sharing this evening and, uh, and, and your participation <laughs> on, on okay. this wild and wacky event. Uh, we're currently projecting for this event to take place in August when we can all see each other again. Um, I'd invite y'all to it. I don't know if you wanna fly into Toronto for it, but who knows where we'll be, right? <laughs> all right, uh, we will be doing this again in two weeks time. Tell your friends, tell your friends' friends, tell your enemies. Um, tell your rival ADs. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I have any. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much. Let's, let's thank you for having me. Nice to meet you all. Thanks so much. And <laughs> see if everyone comes to Scotland. Now you know, like, I'll set you up, David. When you get that honeymoon happening, it's happening eventually, I will Someday. hook you up. Great. I mean, I say that. I will tell you where to go. I have no money. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, y'all. Friends, have a good Thanks. night. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.